Hello, everybody. Reporting to you again from the glamour city, Hollywood. The reason the moon is interesting is that, first of all, it's our closest neighbor. It's a large reservoir of resources that we're aware of that exist on the polar regions of the moon. Now, the first thing most people focus on is metals. And I'd like to tell your audience that no, metals is not the first thing. It is water and volatile ices that exist on the north and south pole of the moon in these areas called permanently shadowed regions. Of great interest because it's an energy source, it's propellant. And of course, the basic physics involved is that if I don't have to bring a ton of water up or a, a ton of fuel as an expendable on my rocket from Earth and out of the well and source it out in space, um, then there are tremendous energy savings which result in economic savings for doing so. And it's both technically uh, and economically viable to do so. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for our show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Jeff Plate, who is the CEO of Interstellar Mining. Welcome to the show today. Okay, thanks, Scott, and thanks uh, for having me, and hello to the audience. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, learn a little bit about your background. And by the way, I think you're also the VP of Marketing and Business Development at WGM. So if you could tell us a little bit about WGM and what it does. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's probably a great place to start. So uh, WGM is a longstanding uh, mining and geological consultant. We've been in business, uh, we're celebrating our 60th year actually just this year. Uh, we are, were founded by three of the giants in uh, Canadian mining. They're all inductees in the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame uh, with it. Um, the firm engages in uh, high level consulting and auditing work throughout the mining business. Uh, we've operated in about 130 countries uh, over our history and operating in about every possible mineable commodity that you can think of and probably a few you haven't. So, uh, so we have that background. Uh, myself, I originally started my career in finance. So I was a compliance officer and then moved on to being the head of investment research for Manulife Securities uh, here in Canada. Uh, your uh, uh, readers or your, your audience may be familiar with Jan Hall. John Hancock out of Boston, which is part of Manulife's group. Um, and then I decided to uh, change careers and became a geophysicist. So I'm a, an economist, a CFA, and a, and a, a geophysicist. And then through our work at WGM, uh, one of our partners uh, a long time ago was approached by the UN Space Agency uh, looking for advice on mining off-world. As a result of that, my firm has been involved in the space mining file for we're coming up on our third decade uh, with it. And I eventually uh, inherited the file and on the basis of that conducted one of the first commercial studies based on the same methodology we use in terrestrial mining to determine the economic and technical viability of uh, the operation. As a result of that, we formed Interstellar Mining of which WGM currently owns a third of and I am the CEO of. So that's being a thumbnail. Okay. Can you talk about maybe one or two case studies of something that WGM has done over the last several decades that maybe is fairly sizable that, you know, listeners could say, oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm familiar with that. I've heard of that before. Sure. Okay. Um, well, one of the largest things we've done, for example, in the territorial U.S. is in the, uh, in the past, we were responsible for working with the First Nations groups in uh, Alaska as part of the large uh, land claims treaties uh, that were signed with those peoples. Uh, and helping them to identify the most prospective areas uh, of that state uh, for mining and, and development exploration, and then just help the, uh, the people there kind of carve out those areas of most interest. And the result of all of this was the opening up of large sections of Alaska to active prospecting and mining, for example. Uh, we've done similar work uh, for the Canadian territory of Nunavut. Uh, and we've done other work in places like Nigeria, Zambia, and places like that, where we've done similar sorts of uh, activity. So that's some very large scale stuff that we've been engaged with. Now, I, I recognize that your firm isn't directly um, 
overseeing this per se, but when it comes to environmental or impact work, for instance, and certainly mm -hmm. there's a lot of concern around uh, maybe converting a nature or a certain open environment to for commercial mining purposes, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and certainly in the context of climate action, uh, there's a lot, there's a kind of high insensitivity, including being able to mine for necessary things to even, you know, make batteries like lithium, for instance, um, yeah. how are those kind of considerations taken into context and how is that changing the industry today? Okay. Well, let me first by saying, you know, this isn't your grandfather's mining industry. Um, you know, prior to the 1990s, mining had uh, a reputation as being environmental villains. Um, and in some cases that was very rightly earned. Um, the industry spends a huge amount of time and effort on environmental, social and governance issues now. Uh, we are the number one employer of Indigenous peoples around the world. Uh, we care very deeply about the environment, being outdoors people uh, in, in the profession. And we have evolved to include uh, the community and social development uh, work everywhere we operate in the world. Uh, because we've recognized that aside from um, the necessary need to do that, it's just good business. Uh, I like to often say that uh, talk is cheap and fighting is expensive. So if you engage in that uh, true uh, engagement and partnership work with uh, the local communities, wherever you're operating, governments um, and uh, non-NGOs uh, and the like, um, it means that you don't run into problems uh, with respect to getting things done. And, and when you do that right, you don't carry the baggage forward with other projects who are saying, you know, you, you know quite frankly, you screwed it up last time, why should we trust you now? And so there's been a, a massive change in that. And uh, you can see that very clearly in, uh, in all of the major companies and, and what we do. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been very good at uh, getting the wider world to understand that. And then with respect to the climate change uh, challenge, I know you and I, Scott, have spoken on this off, offline here. Um, you know, in order to achieve the electrification goals that we have throughout the world and to switch over to electrified system, you know, you need a lot more metal to do that, whether it's copper, lithium, cobalt, nickel, manganese, all of these sorts of things to make it happen, not only for the uh, material to actually make the vehicles, but also we need to rewire the entire electrical grid. And to do that, we need to mine in some cases as much as six to 11 times the amount of metal we're currently doing. Uh, and if we don't do that and secure those raw materials, we'll not make our goals for climate change. So that's a very important message I'd like to share with your audience. Great. Thank you for that. Now, when we talk about mining, you know, I think we tend to kind of put in a single bucket for those that are not in the industry, but really mining is actually very complex and there's a very varying spectrum of techniques and approaches depending on the kinds of materials that they're trying to go after. Can you give us a, a few examples of the different kinds of mining and the techniques that's involved and really the complexity? Okay. Well, first of all, I'll say, um, there is likely no other industry that has the level of technical knowledge you need to effectively manage this. And when I say that, it's not just high technology, but it's engineering, it's uh, operational understanding of how to uh, get things done in uh, remote or difficult places. You have to deal with a lot of logistical challenges, everything from infrastructure, power, the like. Um, there's the human element in dealing with the, those environmental, social and governance issues. Uh, in some cases, you have long-standing issues with the community. Um, one of the issues we run into regularly in a lot of the developed world is oftentimes there isn't a good functioning municipal government. And so mining, when they come in, end up uh, carrying out many of these functions by putting in necessary infrastructure, engaging with the local communities for the development, setting in things like you know education, training, nursing stations, um, and all of the things that are important with it. And, uh, and that's something we take very seriously. And so those lessons learned have sort of moved forward and why with some of the complexities to segue into off-world off mining is that we recognize all of these things and are comfortable with engaging with all of those aspects um, and taking them into consideration when we look at both the um, financial viability and technical viability of, of doing this. And so we have a very advanced global system for evaluating that that's very well defined, understood, uh, and has been put in place now for at least 30 years. Uh, and that's really what the function of WGM is. And one of the reasons we're, we're well positioned to, uh, to handle the file when it comes to off-world mining. So. 
Yeah, so I think you you alluded to the fact that uh, you know WGM has a really a vast uh, depth of domain expertise and really really requires a level of knowledge to be able to do proper mining. And to your point, it's not just the mining aspect; it's the full ecosystem, uh, being able to actually have you know, uh, you know, the power system, uh, the power system to actually power these machinery, for instance, uh, being able to have fuel, uh, being able to actually helicopter in, if it's remote, uh, certain large equipment, for instance. And these things are logistical challenges, isn't it? So if you're talking about a mountainous region or if you're talking about deserts or places like in Australia, for instance, what are some of the challenges and costs associated with getting all these things in place and then operationalizing it and making sure that it's, uh, it has a full uptime. Okay, um, well, I'll speak very broadly because each mining project has its own unique challenges. So if we're talking about something in the Arctic that's very different than the outback in Australia or you know, in a jungle mountainous terrain, say in Madagascar. Um, so it really depends upon, uh, first of all, the geography of where you are. Uh, so for example, one of the challenges in running mines in, you know, north of the Arctic Circle here in Canada, and there are several operating mines, for example, um, is you only have accessibility for heavy lift into those places via barge and ship, usually uh, near tidewater, uh, for about three months out of the year, um, usually in the summer months. So you basically have to ensure that you have a 12 to 16 month lead time when you're ordering these things so that they can come in on the barge. The alternative is to go through uh, what's called an ice road, which you basically build a highway with frozen lakes and rivers. So you've got transport trucks that bring in uh, consumables and other things. The only other alternative is to fly things in, and that's extremely expensive uh, and problematic. Uh, one of the areas from a power perspective that, that uh, many companies are looking to do is to employ renewable sources of either wind power uh, in the case of the north, because obviously the sun doesn't shine <laughs> for six months of the year in some of these mine sites, there is no sunlight. Uh, so it's very much like the moon in that regard. Um, but they put in wind power, for example, uh, to supplement so you don't need to use as much diesel, for example. Uh, in some of the hotter areas, like in West Africa or Australia or the southwest of the U.S., they have been putting in uh, solar power installations with it that in some cases actually have produced enough power to put back into the grid in places like Burkina Faso or Mali. Uh, so it's actually benefiting some of the local people by having some of that uh, technical expertise there. So. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Scott. <laughs> well, I, part of the reason I'm asking these questions is that even on Earth, where we can actually you know, actually go to the site, do proper site surveys, be able to test samples, be able to actually transport these uh, equipment and, and other supplies. And even then it's difficult, uh, depending on the region and the geography, like you said. But when we talk about <laughs> off earth, uh, the complexities gets compounded when we talk about the moon or trying to mine on asteroids, for instance. So talk about how that really gets challenged to a factor of, you know, nth when we talk about off earth. Okay, um, so um, there's a couple of interesting factors to, to consider when you're dealing with the off world stuff. So for terrestrial mining, generally we're speaking with very large scale operations, especially when you're dealing with bulk commodities. These are you know, not your usual things like gold or diamonds or something like that, but some of the things that might, people might not think a lot about like iron ore or um, limestone or, or other things where you have to move a lot of material. Uh, first of all, off-world, you're dealing with much, much, much smaller scales, like almost Tonka toy size uh, with doing it. So there's certain advantages with doing that. But uh, the problem is, of course, you, um, mining, geology, and all of the associated things are boots on the ground profession. And it is very difficult, expensive, and risky to put people on these operations. So everything is going to be done robotically. Now, the great news about this is that we went to the moon, our grandparents, uh, with it, and there's been tremendous development in terms of autonomous and semi-autonomous uh, robotics, communications, and other things, um, both uh, for use here uh, on Earth in um, extreme environments. Uh, and so a lot of that is being applied then off-world in a sort of virtuous circle between both uh, groups. And then additionally, some of the other sort of challenges that we have around, for example, power, the small nuclear or modular nuclear reactors, for example, um, they're looking to actually have proof of concept in space to bring that to remote areas here on Earth uh, as a way of uh, producing power in these places that don't require a lot of movement of diesel um, and something that provides um, zero emissions, which is an interesting uh, aspect of this that goes hand in hand. Uh, one of the things I've found over the course of my journey 
uh, in dealing with space mining is it crosses so many silos and so many industries that normally would never talk to one another. And it's a tremendous opportunity here um, as a species actually to, to align some of these, these mines and once you get them mixed together in the same room, you know, great things can happen. So. All right. So I'm going to actually come back to some of those risks and challenges of uh, trying to mine on the moon, for instance, or mm -hmm. uh, extraterrestrial. But let's first first focus on why is the moon interesting and what are the opportunities from a mining perspective? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the first thing I like to say about the, the reason why the moon is, is A, it's our closest neighbor. Um, so it's three days away by, by rocket. So it's not uh, what we're talking about where it's nine months away when we're talking about Mars one way. Uh, and of course, you know, asteroids and stuff can, can move around depending on their orbits. Uh, but the reason the moon is interesting is that, first of all, it's our closest neighbor. It's a large reservoir of resources that we're aware of that exist on the polar regions of the moon. Now, the first thing most people focus on is metals. And I like to tell your audience that no, metals is not the first thing. It is water and volatile ices that exist on the north and south pole of the moon in these areas called permanently shadowed regions. These are usually craters that are on the poles that never see sunlight. So they're very, very, very cold. Minus um, or 40 degrees Kelvin or minus 250 degrees Celsius roughly. So the thing is, is that uh, these areas act as traps for material that may have existed for billions of years and are constantly being seeded by comets, asteroids and other things slamming into the moon over the course of time. Uh, the reason the water is particularly of interest is a it's at surface uh, as ices so it's fairly easy to mine uh, without having to use explosives or knock things together which is difficult in a low gravity environment um, and then um, processing it is fairly straightforward and simple uh, but when you take water and you electrolyze it into liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen you have rocket fuel and that is what powers the space shuttle the Falcon rockets uh, all of that sort of aspects in space uh, or provides the precursor chemicals necessary to, to make that fuel. Uh, so consequently, that's of great interest because it's an energy source, it's propellant. And of course, the basic physics involved is that if I don't have to bring a ton of water up or a, a ton of fuel as an expendable on my rocket from Earth and out of the well and source it out in space, um, then there are tremendous energy savings which result in economic savings for doing so, and it's both technically uh, and economically viable to do so at this stage uh, without any new technology and with uh, investments that are quite frankly well in line with what you would expect for capital and operating expense uh, expenses on terrestrial mines. So that's one of the things that's changed very dramatically and something that uh, my firm was actually just presenting this week at the World Mining Conference called the Prospectors and Developers Association of Conference in Canada here, which is held every year in Toronto. Um, where we had, um, I think I just heard this morning, 17,000 attendees, which is down from the usual 30 because they had to move it because of COVID. So, but uh, uh, we're talking about it every year and uh, the mining industry is definitely getting engaged. So, so walk us through how would this actually be implemented and, and get to a point of scale? Okay. Um, well, the, the first stage, and this is what interstellar mining is going to do, and there's a couple of different ways to skin this cat, but this is the approach that we're taking. First and foremost, and this is just like any terrestrial prospecting and exploration uh, project, uh, you need to go out and do reconnaissance work. Uh, so on Earth, that would involve uh, you know, a prospector or a prospecting crew going out to the area, field mapping, knocking off rock samples, testing and assaying them for mineral contact to ensure that you've got something that is uh, potentially economic um, and you've got a concentration of ore or whatever material you're looking for. On the moon, that's a little bit more difficult and challenging because in order to get a boots on the ground mission there, specifically a rover, costs about 250 million US at this stage. Um, and of course, you don't wanna send that into a very small area unless you know there's something there in terms of a showing uh, of what you want. So what we're proposing to do as a company is send up our first mission, which is a satellite-based reconnaissance mission uh, that has two objectives. First, to improve the orbital data resolution that currently exists from some of the existing missions that have gone up, like the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the LRO from NASA, which has been you know, of tremendous value. Um, but then we are planning to include a series of probes or impactors uh, on this uh, that are the size of about a two liter um, pop bottle, uh, just to put it into the mind's eye for your, your listeners. Um, and that will be a hollow point. What we'll do is from low orbit, uh, drop these down and target them. I, we refer to it as the bombing mission. 
so we drop it in, it will drive a column of material inside the probe, and it'll give us an opportunity to actually touch the ground, because it's a boots on the ground profession, and take a number of both uh, scientific and geological uh, readings about that, relay the data, and that will allow us to then figure out from our reconnaissance level, first of all, is there water in volatile locations on the dozen or so locations that we're looking at? We'll get some hard data about uh, what the information is there. Fortunately, it's point data, which is uh, less valuable because uh, you want to see the lateral extent of these things, but uh, this is the best we can do right now. And then that will inform us about the second mission, which is to actually send down a rover, will allow us to do some lateral drilling, trenching, and other prospecting and assaying uh, to ensure that we've got sufficient uh, quantity and quality of uh, potential ore uh, that we can then mine. Uh, and then the third mission is very simply to uh, deploy the, um, the mine site equipment uh, to actually do the whole thing, which will require about two or three uh, landing missions. Um, and that's sort of the bare bones of, of what we're doing. So, so just, just to have a little bit of comparison, the kind of uh, areas that where, where you suspect that there could be lunar ice, uh, mm -hmm. on Earth, where are the regions that would most closely resemble something like this? Well, on Earth, obviously, we wouldn't mine ISIS, uh, simply because water is very plentiful and cheap and basically has a value of nothing, unless you desperately need it like the folks in Southern California. Um, but but in, in, terms of, in terms of having uh, potentially no sun, sunlight whatsoever and a certain temperature range, for instance, and then it, the, the terrain aspects. Yeah, um, it really isn't comparable. So this is where I'm sort of stuttering a little bit. Where we do get into extreme environments, in doing operations here on Earth would be, uh, two examples would be sort of open pit operations in Arctic environments, uh, which do exist uh, with it. So you're exposed to high temperatures, four or five months of the year where there's zero sunlight. Uh, there's four months of the year where it's, the sun never sets uh, in some of the polar regions. Uh, so, so there are challenges with equipment, malfunctions and breakdowns in places like Siberia or Northern Canada, for example, or Greenland. Um, so there is some parallels there. Uh, the other side of it is with robotics and semi-atomic operations. One of the things that a lot of the mining equipment that would be useful off-world has been developed for is places like deep underground mine operations and places like South Africa, where you're down, um, you know, eight kilometers below the surface. The, the, the average temperature is 50 degrees Celsius, 100% humidity. A human being can't operate for more than 10 or 15 minutes in that environment. So they've employed uh, similar technologies for their miners, similar to the spacesuits actually used by NASA to allow them to operate for hours in that kind of condition. Or uh, the mining equipment itself can operate down in there. And in some conditions, um, you also get some very acidic uh, or potentially um, you know, uh, naturally occurring chemical reactions from outgassing and things that uh, are difficult for people with respirators and things like that. So ventilation becomes a problem. Um, and so that, that also can apply. So, um, so th those are the closest parallels I can give to Scott. Mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, I think part, part of the, part of the trying to, the attempt is to try to understand um, really the, the, the level of complexity and the challenges and, 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 and make sure that the listeners understand those aspects. So in the case of the Arctic uh, or polar, for instance, mm -hmm. being able to actually send missions and even the machinery actually being able to operate uh, in those temperatures is a challenge. I mean, like you can't even turn off engines, for instance. Uh, and how do you actually fuel things like that? Um, mm -hmm. And then the, the autonomy. So even if they're semi-autonomous or autonomous or remote control robots, has that been already... Um, tested on the field in these extreme conditions on Earth, even before we actually send anything over to the moon, for instance? Absolutely, Scott. We've, we've been doing uh, testing on this for at least 25 years that I can uh, recall. Um, in fact, my chief technology officer, a fellow by the name of Dale Boucher, actually worked for um, the mine um, test center. That's how we got into the space mining game something called NORCAT, which is done by the Canadian federal government in Sudbury, where they test autonomous equipment in an operating mine. Um, and it's the test bed for all of these equipment. So they've, they've got uh, longstanding uh, equipment that's autonomous or semi-autonomous for drillers, muckers, yeah. trucks that are employed in mining today. Um, so so, so I think, so I, I think, you know, I think one of the things that that's important and there's a kind of underlying assumption that's not being stated is that 
on earth, we can afford to have telecommunication and even pipe, pipe wires, so Schneiders and mm -hmm. electrical systems, things that are, that are on the ground. Even if there's no Wi-Fi, you can actually uh, provide that through some of these wiring and cables, for instance. On the moon, uh, communication or what we call PNT is going to be problematic and challenging to, to say the least. These machines can't just work in, um, independently. They have to be connected to some network and be able yeah. to be actually controlled. The, right. the infrastructure that's needed to even support these things, um, you know, what, 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 what's going to be really needed on the ground to make this happen? Okay. Well, uh, obviously, there is a constellation of communication satellites in low Earth orbit and geostationary orbit on Earth. Um, communication is something that is currently very spotty on the moon. It's mainly the deep space uh, network through NASA, which has a bit speed of kind of similar to the 1990s dial-up. <laughs> so it's terrible. Uh, however, there are uh, lots of plans on the books and uh, with communications companies that are putting constellations of communication satellites uh, on, on the moon uh, with it that are fairly well advanced and look like they'll be put in place in the next few years. In the meantime, um, it requires you know, a satellite relay in orbit over the moon uh, to get line of sight communications with Earth on the polar regions in particular, except for one spot on the moon called the Peak of Eternal Life on the South Pole, which has 24 hour line of sight communications with Earth and 24 hour sunlight, hence the name. Uh, with it. So you do need some communication relays and things uh, to do so uh, with it, but uh, that challenge is quickly being met. And uh, of course, with the evolution of things like CubeSats and things, these things can be deployed in a sort of a mesh system uh, that can be quite effective in relaying things back and forth. Uh, I am also aware on the edges of it that, you know, there are military communication networks that are being established on the moon as well. So, because uh, that very much uh, NATO's declared the moon uh, the strategic high ground and a war fighting domain. And so um, mainly the Chinese and the U.S. are very much engaged in, uh, in building up the capabilities there. So. Absolutely. Yep. Very much aware of that. Let's talk about scale. So again, I didn't give you enough time to talk about how you would actually go about commercializing this on the moon. But it's one thing, because I think you're the one that actually said it is, on Earth, on terrestrial, we, we can actually do things on a very large scale because we need to. Yep. And then certainly when it comes to being able to fuel rockets, landers, rovers, and other missions to eventually Mars, we're going to need scale, scale in terms of oxygen, hydrogen, as well as other minerals. How are we going to mm -hmm. get that scale from the initial, let's call it test bed or pilots or small samples? Okay. Well, just to put this into perspective, um, you know, um, you, you, many of your viewers may be familiar with sort of the big pictures, the big open pit mines and things in, in throughout the world. They're like huge quarries, right? And that's what mining people are generally used to. But, uh, you know, the, the, the size of the processing unit for Stellar is the size of a desk. Uh, our rovers and equipment are a meter, meter and a half long. So they're not, they're, they're small pieces of equipment, but they are sufficient given the initial market demands uh, available to produce, you know, a thousand tons of water a year, uh, which is more than sufficient to supply the, the lunar market for the next few years. So the, one of the issues with scale is, uh, and this goes back to economics, is, you know, you can't produce 100,000 tons of water, you'll blow out the economics because you'll just massively flood the market uh, with, with what's going on. But the value of the commodity is such that the value of a, of a ton of anything on the lunar surface is $62 million US because that's what it costs to actually ship it there. So if I can produce it for substantially less than that, which I can, um, then the economics makes sense. Um, and like anything, when uh, initial operations are set up, and I always use the analogy of sort of when the Europeans came to the new world, you know, they set up small operations, whether it was a foundry, a cooperage, a port and it started small and then built from there. And we will probably follow a similar sort of prospect process on the lunar surface. It might be accelerated just because of the technological advances uh, with it and the dramatic uh, exponential decrease in costs. Um, and you will get the economies of scale and things with it. Uh, the nice thing too, is it's also modular with what we're doing. So we can just tack on uh, additional capacity with fairly limited additional capital expenditure. So, and the cost to do all of this, by the way, is somewhere around 600 million US dollars all in, uh, which is about half of what sort of an average moderate sized mine would cost to do here on earth. So it's well within the reach of, of terrestrial uh, mining, both finance and technical capability.
release with no, no new technology being developed. So it's all already been done. Just got to deploy it. <laughs> all right. So we have time for one more question, which is uh, lessons learned. Any uh, lessons learned that you can share from your experience? Sure. I mean, uh, I think the biggest lesson learned is that uh, no one industry and no one group can do this by themselves. Uh, it, it, you know, it takes a village, uh, if, if it were, in terms of the expertise from a dear, disparate number of, of industries and people and knowledge seekers. So the real strength in investing and diversifying your risk in this sector is to team up with people who have a wide background uh, of demonstrating the capability to get this thing done, because that's really where the success is going to be on this. So hopefully that will be a, a helpful chestnut for your, for your audience, Scott. Super. So with that, I have been joined by Jeff Plate, who is the CEO of Interstellar Mining. Thanks for joining today. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.